Well, hi, everybody. Um, I have the pleasure and the honor of introducing our speaker today. Her name is Dr. Lori Patton Davis. She is the chair of the Department of Educational Studies at The Ohio State University. She has served as um, the American Education Research Association Division of Equity and Inclusion Officer. She's a scholar and an author, and I actually have already pinned about three articles that you wrote um, that I want to now get and read and devour. Dr. Patton Davis, we are grateful to have you. Um, Westerville City Schools is on a journey of becoming more responsive and equitable educators. And we are looking forward to learning from you. So thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate any opportunity to connect with educators. I'm fairly new to Columbus. This is what the beginning of my second year uh, at Ohio State and living in this area. And so uh, having these opportunities, um, uh, I think it's just awesome. Um, although she's not on this call, I wanna thank uh, future Dr. Cynthia for inviting me um, uh, to give this presentation and thank you for uh, that great introduction. Um, I'll go ahead and get started and I'm assuming others you know, may come in here and there. Uh, I am going to try, this is like the third or fourth presentation I've given in Zoom. Sometimes the PowerPoint acts right, sometimes it doesn't, but we're gonna see. Let me do this first. Now, can you all see the screen or can you see what I see? I'm trying to figure out what you all can see. I can I see, see the your PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Okay, you I see, the, see the screen. I can see the PowerPoint, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you don't see my presenter view. That's what I'm trying to avoid, that you just this see the-, the presenter view. It's the presenter view. Yeah. Um, okay. We see the slides. Okay, let me see. I click join without. Okay, I'm just gonna do my regular view and keep it moving. <laughs> okay. Can you just see the regular screen? We see the main slide on the right and then all the other slides on the left, like you would if you were working on the PowerPoint. Okay. Okay. Give me one second. Uh, Does Zoom give you an option for which screen you want to share if you have like a, a primary and a secondary screen? I am trying to find that. Um, I think there's something in the settings that allows me to maybe select since I have two. Oh, there it is. <coughs> Not as familiar with Zoom as I am with Google Meet. I, I know in Google Meet you can choose which screen to share. So I should be able to do that. I don't know what it was. Okay. When you when you shared it, did you put it on presentation mode? Did you want me to mute mine? You have your sound on. Oh, there you go. Your you can use yours. So you all see this, okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm gonna. Yeah, all right. So so to get us moving, I, I'll just not use notes. Um, okay. Um, but as long as you all can see this, great. Um, 
So the title of this presentation is When They Fail to See Us, Culturally Relevant Mentoring for Black Girls. And FYI, I can no longer see your faces. So um, if you have questions, by all means, type them in the chat box and I'll get to it. Um, the first, okay. Um, because I can't really see the chat box, I'll ask you um, to maybe call out um, some names of the top five most influential Black leaders in the U.S. because I can't see you. So go ahead, call them out. Michelle Obama. Mm -hmm. I say both of them, both Obamas. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go with Stacey Abrams. Okay. The oh, Atlanta. The Atlanta mayor, I can't think, is that Stacy? Oh, Keisha Lance Bottoms. Keisha Lance Bottoms, Paul yeah. Harris. Paul Harris. Okay. Anybody else? Oprah. Oprah Winfrey. Dr. Kendi. Okay, Abram. Tyler Perry. Okay. Condoleezza Rice. LeBron James. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Uh, so I'll stop right there. Um, these are all, you know, wonderful names. And I've done this, uh, you know, asked this question in a lot of different presentations. And typically, if people don't know that the presentation is going to be on Black girls or Black women, the names are primarily Black men, right? Uh, and so it is not uncommon to hear names like Cornell West, Michael Eric Dyson, I've heard LeBron James, um, Barack Obama. Um, and part of why I always ask this question is to get a feel for the room and how people are, I guess, reading Black women um, in our larger uh, society. Um, but nine times out of 10, it's usually, if, if, it, if this was just, I don't know, a, a presentation about, I don't know, Black history, or um, uh, I was, you know, looking at, you know, educators, a lot of times the names are typically Black men, right? And, um, the, and, and then when I ask people to be gender specific, that's when I might get Michelle Obama or Kamala Harris or, or Oprah Winfrey. But most times they're not the first names to uh, come to mind um, for people when I ask the question. Um, and for me, part of that has to do with uh, the invisibility uh, that faces Black women. So for today's presentation, I'm going to talk about the sociopolitical context for Black women and girls, um, and then I'll focus more on the status of Black girls and the need for culturally relevant mentoring, and then some key considerations for mentoring programs and initiatives that center Black girls. Um, I'll offer a couple of examples that um, I found uh, online, my graduate student helped me to find some of these, and then I'll open the floor for Q&A. Um, so be before even talking about Black girls, I always think it's so important to provide the context for how they, you know, operate within our society. And oftentimes when we think about Black women uh, and girls uh, and their experiences, uh, they're often viewed through the stereotypes that are unsettling. And many of the common ones might be uh, look, uh, being considered, you know, the mammy, the, the woman who she's unattractive, she, you know, doesn't have a partner, and her whole goal in life is to take care of other people. So she takes care of other people, other people's children, um, does not take care of herself. Um, sapphire, uh, so the woman, the loud, sassy, neck rolling, um, woman, you know, cursing, who's disrespectful, all of these, you know, different things. Uh, Jezebel, who is, you know, sexually active, using her body to get the attention of people, um, using people, um, the superwoman, and I think oftentimes people look at the superwoman as a more positive um, um, 
uh, projection onto black women, but it's not, but a superwoman who, you know, she doesn't feel anything. She's working towards a goal. She can do all of these different things um, and, you know, not get tired or not be, uh, she's almost invulnerable. Um, and then, you know, in my um, work over the last several years in reading um, how scholars have um, constructed Black women in their work. Uh, there's one author who talks about Black, he, he poses the question around whether or not Black women are the new model minority. And he's basing this comparison off of um, the, the model minority myth that's often been projected onto uh, Asian and Asian American uh, uh, ethnic groups, particularly uh, Chinese and Japanese uh, folks. And so when you think about a new model minority, they become the uh, uh, exception, right? Not the rule. And others within their population group should be looking to them for how, you know, they should behave or how um, they should carry themselves. Um, and so that, that's, I think, a, a newer way I'm thinking about these um, stereotypes in that uh, the superwoman is almost like a model minority in, in some regards. Um, and then I've been, you know, looking into this idea of Black girl magic, which um, was originally, I think, introduced to really offer a positive um, way of thinking about uh, Black women's, you know, contributions. But when we talk about black girl magic, the reality is that how women, how black women operate and, and how they do what they do, it's not magic. It's, it's actually quite labor intensive. And so when people use black girl magic as this positive thing, but dismiss all of the labor and work that goes into um, the contributions that we make, uh, it becomes a problem. Uh, and so we, one part of the sociopolitical context is around unsettling stereotypes, and that's how we get seen, but there are also ways that we get unseen, whether these stereotypes are intact or not. And uh, the unseen to me is more about invisibility and invisibility politics. And we've seen numerous examples of this throughout history. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you at this point know about, you know, hidden figures and the fact that we have, you know, three uh, black women working for NASA doing, uh, you know, amazing work, but aren't seen. Um, and, some of that is due to the time in which they were at NASA. But even now, you know, to have it recognized decades later, uh, I think gives some uh, credibility to this idea that they just had not been seen. Um, and I think about a lot of the conversation and discourse around Breonna Taylor, um, where it was very difficult to locate Breonna Taylor in the larger conversation around state uh, section violence because the um, the attention was on George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and you know other black men who have been killed and certainly um, we need to care about what's happened to George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery but some way somehow in the discourse Breonna Taylor got forgotten right until people started raising you know concerns around uh, 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 the police officer's behavior and killing her and not being held uh, accountable. Um, but I mean, this is, you know, not just a present day thing. If you think about Claudette Colvin, you know, when we think about, or even when we teach kids about uh, the Montgomery uh, bus boycott, it starts with Rosa Parks. But prior to her, there was Claudette Colvin, right? Who uh, refused to give up her seat. But because she didn't meet the standards of respectability at the time, I believe she was either pregnant or had a child and she was 16. And so she was seen as a threat to the larger movement, right? And so these are some of the ways that I think Black women and Black girls become unseen um, in our um, larger societal context. And so if we think about stereotypes um, and how Black women are seen and framed, and we think about uh, invisibility and how we kind of slip through the cracks or our experiences are ignored, it leads to particular outcomes, right? These um, negative outcomes that we've read, you know, and the, or heard about in the news or read in a magazine or read through a research study, they don't just happen out of the blue, right? There is a larger systemic or structural thing that is happening that uh, makes Black women and girls particularly vulnerable. And one of those things is around just disinvestment, right? And the lack of protection. So, you know, according to Black Women's Blueprint, 60% of uh, 
um, black girls are sexually assaulted before turning uh, uh, 18 years old. Um, there's also this lack of care. And so um, I was just recently reading about um, a black woman doctor, you know, in terms of class, she had all of the pieces, but something happened um, in childbirth where her child was born, she lost her life, right? And so black women's mortality rate is two times higher than white women and other racial groups. And we're often chronically undertreated for pain. I think it goes again back to uh, the superwoman narrative um, and um, black women not seen as capable of vulnerability, right? Or not being seen as capable of experiencing pain or when we tell a doctor we're in pain, there's something that makes them disbelieve us, right? <laughs> uh, or fail to believe us. And then issues around, you know, equitable pay. Black women are paid 61 cents for every dollar in comparison to white men. And then among all women, the wage gap is smaller. Um, we get 80, 80 cents for each dollar. But overall, you know, we move from just having equal payday to actually needing to have Black women's equal payday um, because how we're paid is so inequitable. And so I, I think, uh, so that, that piece where we talk about these outcomes and not showing up out of the blue, um, if, if, if you have a hard time conceptualizing a group um, and thinking about their experiences um, and there isn't you know, proper framing to think about them, then they can be forgotten. And so Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, she's a noted uh, a legal scholar. She is in charge of the African-American Policy Forum and um, largely responsible for the hashtag say her name. Um, but she says, when there is no name for a problem, you can't see a problem. And when you can't see a problem, you can't solve it. And by this, I don't mean that black women and girls are problems, but the issues that they're facing are major problems um, and there isn't this large scale effort to try to address them to um, center um, black women and girls. So I want to switch from there just to kind of talk about black girls um, and their status, uh, whether it's in our schools, society at large, but one of the major issues affecting black girls is around adultification. So there's a recent um, study that talked about how adults perceive black girls as needing less protection and nurturing than white girls. And that beginning as early as age five, they're more likely to be, you know, perceived as acting older or acting older than their age and being more knowledgeable about adult things, being expected to take on, you know, adult roles and responsibilities. Um, and because um, they're seen as adults, even though they are children, it contributes to uh, these negative characterizations of them, right? Um, that lead into or, um, you know, how you've been treated shapes who you are and how you, you know, operate in the world. Um, but then they become perceived as women become perceived as hypersexual, um, um, even as girls, and that has an impact as they go into teens and, you know, become women. Um, and as a result of being perceived as older, right, and being perceived as needing less protection, all of these things are, you know, uh, closely linked to uh, the school to prison pipeline and the criminalization of girls in schools. And so, um, the other piece around adultification, uh, and I was just, you know, leading into this, is this push out and discipline. I don't know who's in charge of this. Can you mute that person's mic? Uh, but um, nationwide, Black girls in K through 12 are, you know, seven times more likely to receive one or more out of school suspensions, four times more likely to, to be arrested, three, three uh, times more likely to receive corporal punishment. Um, we take those birds. Dr. Um, Dr. Pat Davis. Yes. Okay. Well, no, everybody who's on this call, you need to mute your microphone. Give me. No, not right now. Not right now. No. Not really no. If you're on this call, you need to mute your microphone. Yeah, I mean. If you are on the call, please mute your microphone. Thank you. Okay. My apology. Oh, that's fine. Um, 
And so I um, pulled this one quote because again, when we think about the school to prison pipeline, we think about um, either black boys or black and uh, Latino boys, but we rarely think about girls, right? And they are equally uh, susceptible to the same pipeline. Uh, so wanted to share this one uh, quote by uh, LaRue McCoy Lewis, who says, if we think about the narrative of mass incarceration, we think about the ways in which Black men and Black boys have been locked up at increasing rates since the 1980s. And while this is true, the fastest growing incarceration rate is among Black and Latino women. And because we haven't thought seriously about what's happening with Black girls and Latina girls, we tend to make the issue of incarceration solely male and we miss the different ways in which we need to be intervening not just for our young boys but also our young girls and so again how we frame things or the lack of framing has significant implications for black girls so if we you know think about all of the things that i've shared and what does it mean you know uh for black girls in the columbus area uh, i had a chance to read the commission on black girls uh, re uh their recent report and was able to just pull out some really interesting things um, and draw some conclusions so some of the things they found just with the 11 to 15 um, age group 60 cent 66 percent attend public schools, they have GP at 40% have GPAs of 3.1 higher, um, a little under half report being bullied at school, uh, more than half have some form of leadership experience, and more than half struggle with feelings of depression and anxiety. And if you look at the 16 to 22 age group, the uh, uh, rate of bullying, you know, is still over 50%. There's uh, an exponential uh, jump in terms of the 70, uh, almost 72% who struggle with feelings of depression and anxiety. And you couple these things with, you know, many of them having to work. Um, a large uh, a majority of them are in schools um, and 23% have experienced homelessness. Among all the age groups, 70% have received detention, suspension, or expulsion from schools, and 60% live in single mother households. Now, they have a, a low absenteeism, which I think is important. So they're actually in school, right? Um, uh, but um, uh, a lot of, uh, among the respondents for uh, this study, the average adverse child, uh, childhood experiences score was three. Um, but about 40% of girls had higher scores, right? And what made them happy, their sources of happiness were uh, music, family, and friends. School was the lowest voted item, you know, after nothing. So I think that's really telling um, that they're in school, right? <laughs> um, but there isn't anything about their experiences that makes them pick school as a top choice in what brings happiness to them. So I think as educators, we have to think about what environments are we uh, creating and constructing for, for Black girls to not just survive, but to actually thrive and enjoy learning, right? Enjoy uh, their educational experiences. Um, and then, you know, I don't have it on this slide. Uh, it's actually in my notes, um, but uh, there is a smaller percent of them considering college, you know, as an option after uh, high school. So I think uh, the other piece to think about is how are we socializing them toward college or toward, um, you know, post-secondary opportunities that can help them uh, as far as, you know, their economic standing in society. If you, you know, look at uh, labor statistics, Black women are uh, the overwhelming majority of Black women are laborers, right? And they're also caretakers of their families. Um, and, you know, what what are they being exposed to? What capital are they being, um, um, you know, socialized to obtain in order to improve their life circumstances? And so I think one of those things um, that is really important um, for Black girls is mentoring, right? Um, there's clearly a need. Um, and what mentoring does is it, you know, uh, brings in, you know, makes girls seem, so it increases their visibility to people so they don't feel invisible. Um, there are opportunities to engage uh, with their families. Um, it 
represents an investment in their education. Um, it provides greater connection, um, love, care, um, makes them feel worthy, um, makes them feel wholly human. Um, it can be intergenerational. Um, it could be peer. Um, mentoring can have an advocacy component, um, especially for the most vulnerable girls. Um, it could be advice, it could be guidance, it can be all of those things, depending on what a school, a school district, a community organization envisions it to be, as long as um, Black girls' voices and experiences are at the center of it. And so one such framework um, that uh, I think is really great is a Black girl uh, literacies framework by Muhammad and Haddix. Um, and a Black girl, lit Black girl literacies framework um, refers to sp specific acts in which Black girls read, write, speak, move, and create in order to affirm themselves, their world, and the multidimensional dimensionality of young Black womanhood and our Black girlhood, right? So uh, as I mentioned, how do we create spaces where Black girls feel centered, where we're not questioning, well, why do we need this space for, you know, for Black girls specifically, right? Um, but honoring that and um, helping them to see themselves as important, right, and that they matter. And so there are, you know, a lot of different um, models out there uh, that are culturally relevant for girls. Um, some include Black Girls Rock and Black Girls Lead. There's one of Black Girls Smile, doing ballet, coding, writing. Um, there's a literacy collective where, you know, girls are in a reading group, reading, you know, fiction and nonfiction that where the uh, main person or the subject of that work is, you know, a Black girl. Um, there are others that are more local that I'm trying to learn about. There's Rise, Sister Rise, Femergy, um, uh, OSU Life Sports, um, uh, the, many of the Divine Nine organizations have uh, uh, mentoring opportunities for girls. When be, Prior to coming to Ohio State, I was at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, and there was a girl STEM Institute, there are sister circles. You know, there are all of these different models um, that represent possibilities for how Black girls um, can and should be supported. But overall, I think it's just really important um, if you take nothing else from this, is the value of helping them to feel seen and fully human and, uh, you know, allowing them to be girls. You know, adultification is a real thing, right? I've seen people look at, you know, little girls and say, oh, she's so grown or, you know, you know, all of these things that would suggest she's being viewed as a woman. But what would it mean if we allow Black girls to just simply be girls, to value their innocence and avoid judgment for how, um, they operate, you know, um, I think uh, this, you know, notion that Black girls are loud, you know, how do we as teachers, rather than saying, you know, she's too loud, try to think about, well, why is she loud? And one, why do I perceive her raising her voice as loud, right? What am I comparing or who am I comparing her to? Um, but I think it's so important to allow space to imagine and dream. So I uh, recently finished watching HBO's Lovecraft Country, right? And uh, if you're familiar with that series, then you know about Hippolyta. And I just think it's really amazing that this, you know, Black woman had to be teleported into another dimension to become who she was meant to be, right? To have this space to dream and imagine different ways of operating in the world where she wasn't second class, right? Um, um, but I think uh, also mentoring possibilities include, you know, maintaining connections, not misinterpreting behavior, celebrating girls, um, not seeing them as all the same, because even though, you know, the race and gender piece may be the same, there could be class, there could be, uh, you know, uh, girls who are, you know, developing their sexual identities, their gender identities. Um, I think it's important to give Black girls the benefit of the doubt and not you know, assume that they're up to no good or assuming that they're being fast, you know, uh, these, um, uh, this language that sort of surrounds black girls. Um, and uh, I think the thing that really elevates possibilities for mentoring is when we ask 
black girls what they need, right? Talk to them um, and get a better sense of what what makes sense for them, right? What what do they want to see? Um, and it's important, you know, there's no age where you're too young to teach children how to navigate racism and sexism, right? Um, and understand how they, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the, the joy that they feel and who they are um, is always um, uh, vulnerable to larger structural uh, systems, uh, 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 you know, that were built to take those things away. Um, and how do we teach them, you know, advocacy through self-advocacy through uh, mentoring programs? Those are, you know, just some of the possibilities. Um, this is my information. I'm actually working on a mentoring program. So if any of you are uh, interested and want to be contacted as we pull um, our structure together, I would be happy to uh, connect with you. Because I cannot see everybody, I am going to stop uh, the PowerPoint share and then just open the floor up to any questions um, or just general dialogue. Will you have your contact information available for us again, or could you possibly put that slide back up so I could take a picture of it? Oh, sure. Oh, you know what? Let me type it in the chat box. Thank you. Okay. Are there questions I can answer or are there comments? So I have a question. Um, so on a daily basis, how do we help black girls to feel seen in our classrooms, um, in the hallways? Cause I always stand outside my door and like welcome the students into my room. How do we help to make them feel seen? Um, you know, it, it, it may seem hard, but I think, think about how you would want to be seen. You know, um, a, a lot of the ways that I do it, and I'm um, more post-secondary working with um, girls who are wanting to, you know, be in college and, you know, get through uh, their four years successfully, but making people see what you're doing is good by, you know, welcoming each student into the classroom and those sorts of things, but how do Black girls show up in the curriculum? You know, um, if you're teaching history, how do Black women's experiences show up in history? Or, you know, how do they show up in social studies? Uh, I think that I, I can't stress you enough how important it is that people see themselves reflected in the curriculum. Um, and that's really a part of uh, the, the larger, I guess, literature on culturally relevant pedagogy. So being able to see yourself in the literature other ways of being seen is having, you know, teachers who look like you or guest speakers who look like you. Um, and even if it's not, um, you know, specifically, you know, pertaining, I guess, to Black girls, some of the issues that they face might apply to other girls. So how do those particular, you know, issues, concerns, or challenges show up in what you're teaching? Um, you know, in music class, it's been meaningful for my children to not just learn classical, right? I want them to learn classical, but I want them to learn R&B too, right? I want them to learn Motown. And I've, I've been really appreciative of teachers who have taken the time to study and think about all of the different cultural groups represented in their classrooms and to do things that are purposeful. Um, to, to, to make them feel seen. Um, one thing that teachers often do, and it I think this kind of goes, I don't know how much work you all have done around implicit bias, but when teachers call on students, they're less likely to call on black girls. Um, they're actually less likely to call on girls, period. Um, and so I've, you know, even in my own classrooms, I do, I take turns, right? To make sure that I am not always calling on, um, uh, you know, uh, the males in my classroom that I am, you know, going back and forth, you know, and students already know, you know, <laughs> so there isn't this uh, feeling that somebody is being left out of the conversation. 
those are just some of the ways. I mean, and they're not unique per se. I just think um, uh, you, it, you have to be really purposeful. Um, I was trying to catch some of these in questions in the comments. Oh, I wow. Just wanted, oh, oh go sorry. Ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say that the some of those statistics, in particular, the assault statistics, um, scarred me. And <laughs> um, I just was thinking that we need to be doing more in terms of providing SEL support, mm -hmm. as well as curricular support. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all. I think so. And, and you know, so S SEL isn't my area. Um, and I think because, <laughs> because I'm at Ohio State, right, and a department chair, I have heard a lot of talk about um, SEL being a really good thing. And now there's more, um, not pushback against it, but um, how it's being conceptualized in a way uh, where SEL is somehow becoming uh, focused on white white children. Um, I'm still learning about it, but I, again, as I noted before, I think with anything, how we purposefully serve particular populations is important. So if we're going to do social emotional learning, what does that look like for a black girl? Now, because that's not my area, I can't really tell you that, but I think it's worth exploring. Um, I would love to see a model out there that is social, you know, emotional learning for, for black girls. I think along with that, just your, here, I'll put my video on so it doesn't look weird. <laughs> um, whoops, there we go. So along with that, just what you were saying with the, um, you know, the adultification, that was huge, you know, and I think that's true. And so that would be a whole SEL, you know, mm -hmm. aspect of it that, hey, why aren't you growing up? You should be able to take care of this, blah, 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 blah. And you have all this responsibility where we might not do that with the white students. We might be like, oh, honey, let me help you. You know, let's, you know, whatever. So that, you know, if that is ever created, I think that that whole factor, I never really thought about that. Mm -hmm. But I can, I can totally see that. We're like, yes, you do have, you know, strong black women who take care of their families and they're, they're you know, the older sisters are taking care of, you know, the younger siblings or whatever. And, you know, we don't realize that that carries on to every aspect of their life or whatever. So to me, that's stressful right there. I mean, these kids mm -hmm. that are trying to do remote learning and all this stuff, well, they may have other responsibilities put on them or, you know, whatever. So it's, that's good stuff. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. I always think about that movie and I watch, uh, I, I, I love film. Um, uh, I think it's Beasts of the Southern Wild, right? It was about uh, New Orleans around the time of Hurricane Katrina. And it was when uh, I think uh, Kavanjane uh, Wallace you know, was the main character or whatever. And she was six, right? She's taking care of a, you know, a sick father. There is no mother around. And I, they had a scene of her, you know, trying to cook food and do all of these things to run this house. And I couldn't imagine doing that at six years old. I, just, I simply could not, but that is a reality and perhaps not that deep, I don't know. But I, I know for many black girls, that's a reality or this expectation of having to, you know, take care of and, you know, pitch in. And those things are important, right? Um, it does uh, instill you with certain, you know, uh, responsibilities, but those responsibilities should not steal your girlhood, right? You should still be able to actually live and operate as a girl. You should be able to play rope and go outside and, you know, ride your bike and do all of those things that girls do. <laughs> right. Wow. Yep. That's so good. Well, can you put that name of that movie or whatever you just say? Can you put that in the chat box so I have that? That sounded interesting. I think this is the right one. You said the seven. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, I have not read. I was looking at the question um, about books, movies, or story recommendations for Black girls. Um, going back to you know Love Cry Country, the first thing that I thought about is where is the astronomy club for Black girls, right? 
the fact that, uh, you know, she knew about the stars and, you know, she knew all of these things about our, our universe, right? Um, but astronomy was not something um, that I was exposed to early. Um, I think the same can be true around mathematics um, and uh, Black girls seeing themselves in any of the STEM disciplines. Um, but again, if they're not caught early and socialized to love these things, because they're not coming from families where there are astronomers and doctors and lawyers and all of these pieces, um, some are, but many are not. How do we begin to you know, cultivate those things early? I haven't read uh, Goldie Muhammad's book, but I'm sure it is excellent and phenomenal because she is. Um, and so I, I definitely recommend that book is in the chat, but how do we begin to cultivate those things early? Because if, if you're not exposed to it, how, how do you dream that big, right? Um, how do you uh, get access to opportunities to dream that big. Um, and I think, you know, mentoring programs and other, you know, support uh, programs like that um, can do that for uh, Black girls. Uh, there is a question um, in the COVID world, how do we access mentors? Oh, wait a minute. How do we access mentors with restrictions? Relationships are key, are so key for offsetting those uh, ACs. So I um, actually was invited. I, honestly, I can't even remember the school. I just know I'm speaking in November. There is uh, a teacher, maybe it's Reynoldsburg. I can't remember. I did this presentation for Reynoldsburg uh, at one point too. But um, there was a teacher who had a group uh for girls an after school program and so she is doing it on zoom and you know inviting people uh, i think anything's possible as long as there is structure to it um uh yeah and you know after a while i think uh uh building those relationships virtually um you know you kind of get used to it uh i i, I think it's possible so um Man, I, I didn't jump in quickly enough after your last comment. Oh, okay. Um, actually, the um, astronomy club advisor at Westerville North High School. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the past year or two, I've had several Black girls who have participated. Um, last year, our club sec secretary was actually a Somali girl. Oh. Uh, and and she, she did a, a fantastic job. Her, you know, even just her... Um, um, her campaign, her election campaign was, was amazing what, what she, she put forward, she'd be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say that I did anything in particular to reach out to these girls or to invite them other than just the broad announcements that are always made for the club. Um, what, you know, beyond just the, the broad announcement and, and making sure that they know, you know, like everybody knows that it's available um, what more should be done to to help these black girls participate in, um, you know, a strong club, other academic type type clubs. Um, I think with any club, whether it's astronomy or it could be music, it, it could be any field, honestly. Um, one is just helping them to know that they have a contribution um, or just saying, you know, I know this may not seem interesting to you, uh, you know, try it out for, you know, one or two times. If they're coming all on their own, I think that's awesome. So the next step to me, and I don't know what you all do in the club, if you talk about, you know, famous astronomers or like I would ex expose them to people like these hidden figures, you know, right there, they were working for NASA, like helping them to see themselves placed in the history of astronomy, right? Or, you know, encouraging them, you know, to say, hey, you know, it. this is a field where there aren't many who look like you. So, you know, let's, let's work together. Like, let's, you know, think about how do we create, you know, a pipeline um, that exposes you to, you um, uh, astronomy, you know, that piques your interest. But the reality of that um, and why there are so few students of color, broadly speaking, is when, you know, when you go to college and when you go into graduate school, you become one, right? Or 
um, one of few. And so to me, it's not just about the content area, but how to navigate spaces where it may not always look like this club, right? Where there's, you know, more hands-on or, you know, there's activities is going to begin to look different once you get into college, once you get into graduate school. And nine times out of 10, students of color will leave STEM fields because it's too isolating because um, a lot of those uh, courses are weed out courses, you know, all of these things that are designed to um, uh, prevent accessibility. So again, to me, it's about content, helping them to learn and be excited about it. But it's also about, you know, how do you navigate spaces where there isn't this level of care, uh, you know, for who you are in this space. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, other questions or uh, uh, comments? Um, I really enjoyed your presentation. It was, it was very informative and I think I will, it's a lot of information that I could walk away with. So oh, thank I you. will be uh, utilizing as much of it as I can, and also we'll be looking into the mentoring program. Okay, thank you. And thank you so kindly. Thank you all for having me. Um, but I think the important thing is to know you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, uh, there are plenty, plenty of models out there. It is honestly looking at what might work best for your classroom or your school or your particular district and going from there, there can be multiple spaces, um, not just, it doesn't need to just be one space where we you know, shuffle all the black girls over you know, to, to participate in this. There can be multiple ways that we um, you know, invest in them and invest in their success. I have a question um, for you. I teach, um, various levels of Spanish from regular honors, AP, everything from freshmen to seniors and whatnot. And one of the goals in our district, of course, is to get more and more students, um, all minority groups to take more and more higher level classes, honors and AP and whatnot. And um, it's really interesting to me to see my like regular level classes. I have um, a fair amount of minority students of all you know, groups, whatever. Mm -hmm. But then when you get to my honors level classes and it's, the, the contrast is literally black and white. Um, very, very few students of color in my honors classes and my AP classes, it dwindles even further. And as I said, it's a goal of our district to get more and more um, black students uh, in those honors classes. Do you have tips for us, um, since I have your expertise here, um, mm -hmm. like how we encourage those students to take, because they're really capable, obviously, um, how, what, tips would you have to just encourage them to do it when they're fully, fully capable, more than capable of taking the honors level of finding their confidence? Um, what can we do as their teachers to help them find their confidence to take that leap to the honors level? Um, That's a real specific question, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, do they know, do they really know it's an option? It is one. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know what the messaging is around honors courses, but is it, you know, right before the semester, just at the beginning of the year, is it a consistent message? Um, part of why students might not take them um, is because they haven't received any messaging around why they're beneficial uh, in the first place. Um, so I think messaging is important and early messaging around it. Um, and then helping students to know what, what, the incentives are for taking that class. Um, and I don't know if it has something to do with when they're offered. I don't know any of those pieces, but I do know, for example, my college counselor, I'm not college counselor, my high school counselor at the time. Um, and I, I felt this, and I would imagine many Black girls do, uh, feeling like I needed to just do it on my own because I wasn't getting all the information that I needed. Um, and I had questions and because I was in an overcrowded school that just, you know, there wasn't enough counselors to really sit down with me and tell me and walk me through why I needed to be in an honors class, right? When in my 
from my viewpoint, you know, the fun kids were not in honors. You know, like there are all of these mess messages, I think, um, that kids get and um, there isn't uh, enough going on with staff resources uh, or, you know, other resources to help them to understand, you know, sort through all of the things that might hinder them even though they're more than capable. Um, one of the things uh, just within the realm of higher education, black women and girls tend to undermatch, meaning you have the skills and smarts to go to you know, some of the best colleges in the world, but you end up going to a community college, right? And so there's something wrong with the messaging and how, you know, or, or let me give, here's a better example. Um, there's a larger narrative around Black women being the most educated because it's attached to how many degrees they get. But if you dig down into those numbers, the majority of uh, Black women get their degrees from for-profit institutions, right? And so that has something to do with choice and how you're socialized to select an institution. And you're not going to think about choice um, you're less likely to think about choice and how smart you are and all of those things if you're not in an honors class. So again, the messaging has to start really early or you're more likely to undermatch, which again has implications for, you know, the money you make, what jobs you get access to, um, you know, all of these different pieces. So it, it is really and I don't know what the capacity is at Westerville, you know, uh, schools, but it really does require sitting down to say, you are capable of this. I, you know, see all of, you know, this greatness in you. You need to be in this class, right? Um, and helping them understand why it's so important. Like, you know, if they ask them what they want to be and show them how the honors class <laughs> gets them to where they want to be, how it, if they're interested in college, how it gets them into college, or maybe they don't want to go to college and they want to work. How does the honors class prepare them for, you know, the job that they want after high school? So to me, it's not just the honors class. There has to be messaging around what they can do with it. Because if you feel like you can do the same thing with honors or, um, um, you know, the, the regular version of a class, then why would you, you know, why would you do that? Um, yeah, I, I think there are a lot of discourses that students buy into because there isn't someone saying, well, that's not true. Like you actually need this. Um, or, you know, this would be really great if you're interested in doing this later on. Um, and what I'm saying to, to me, these these aren't just like, you know, unique ideas. It really is just about taking the time to talk to people, um, uh, you know, pouring into them, um, teaching them, you know, this is up to, to me about navigating. Like I've seen, I used to work in admissions way back when, and it never ceased to amaze me that uh, there would be, and I was at IU, so many of our Black students came from Gary, Indiana, right, which is one of the least resource districts in the state of Indiana, and awesome students who would come and they would have A's, and, you know, in their regular classes, not have any exposure to honors courses, and, you know, white students from South Bend, and, you know, these other places who had C's and D's, but, you know, to see admissions officers say, well, a C is really a B, and a D is really a C. You know, there are all of these, you know, but a, a, a student in Gary is not going to know these things, right? They're trying to graduate. Um, so to me, it's just how do, how do they get access to this information? Who's having the conversation and actually spending the time having the conversation and not, you know, doing an announcement or sending it home in a letter? You know, I think it, it has to be really purposeful when you see talent um, and, you know, pushing them toward the honors classes. That was a long answer. I'm not sure that I answered it, but I tried. <laughs> no, long response. Good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I do in my class, I uh, teach middle school in Westerville. I used to teach at Columbus uh, State, and mm -hmm. I now teach uh, middle school. And uh, the program I taught there was in their developmental ed program. And so I have brought a lot of former students' stories with their permission, some of them in essay form that I allowed, asked them to give me. 
of uh, what they would have said to themselves when they were in junior high or middle school. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I stress to my students that 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 program, which is a wonderful program at Columbus State, gets between six and 8,000 students every fall who have a high school diploma but cannot read and write above a seventh grade level. I mean, that is the function of the department. Mm -hmm. And that at that point, they are then paying, you know, hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars for, uh, for education that, you know, they had available to them in middle school and high school. And so we talk about those things. And we also, I have them read an article at the beginning of the year about just income differences between people who graduate from high school, people who don't graduate from high school. Um, we talk about the fact that, you know, we can make predictions based on kids' literacy levels as early as third grade, how likely they are to be incarcerated. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they look at you like, what? And they say, well, yeah, let's think about this. You know, if your reading and writing skills limit the choices you have, you know, and they're, they're tough discussions, but I've, I find the kids are really receptive to them. They, you know, like most middle schoolers, they appreciate being spoken to like adults, mm -hmm. um, you know, and for many of them, you know, we, we, were, we were talking about the fact that a lot of our kids are coming in to seventh grade at third and fourth grade reading levels. It's relevant. Mm -hmm. They know that those are their levels because, you know, they're sharing testing information. And so I, you know, again, I don't know, um, what the the overall impact is but it's a conversation that i do try to have with them um the other conversation that i have that does not seem to be very popular <laughs> is the idea that you know academic excellence translates into money in terms okay. of college so i mean i i grew up in welfare so my ticket to college was that my my family had nothing but for a lot of kids like my kids now who do have something um, you know, going into college with college credits from high school. My daughter got $35,000 worth of classes mm -hmm. for her program at Westerville South. Um, and again, it's not going to resonate with a lot of 12 year olds, but there are always a couple that are like, really? Like they're already, we're already, we can do college classes over there before high school. And so I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. It can never be too early never be too early because you always have the student and this one breaks my heart and then I'll stop talking. I was, uh, had to go into the ER this summer for just an injury and out of the exam room came one of my former students. And so she greeted me, we were talking and uh, I said, you should draw 20, 18. I said, how, what are you doing? She goes, oh, I'm gonna be an OBGYN. I said, that's fantastic. I'm like, she goes, you have to go to college for that, right? Mm. Um, it was a genuine question. No one had ever had the conversation with her, mm -hmm. you know? And I, so I said, yes, you do. And I said, she goes, how many years do I have to go? And I said, well, I think if it's something that's, you know, you're really interested in, you should look into it and I'm happy to help you. And she said, yeah, but how many years? <laughs> I said, well, it was a lot of years. And she's like, well, I'm just not that smart for that. And I said, well, you know, talk to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, for every kid that we do get through, there are ones that say, do I have to go to college to be a doctor, you know, right. and it's because no one's ever had the conversation. So anyway. Thank you. And I think it does, it does take that push. Um, but one other strategy I think is doing small bites. So, you know, I think they, for a student to think up oh, college, you know, it, the, the leap might be too big. So what, what's the interim, you know, like, yeah, but before you go to college, you got to do this, right? You know, um, and hopefully by that time, um, there's more of a college going literacy there, right? So that they understand here's uh, some of the things that, you know, you're already ready for college because you did these things, right? So the four years isn't a big deal because we did this in 10th grade and we did this in 11th grade. Um, I think for some students, it just, it takes the, the smaller in-between steps. Um, That's why most of our conversation usually centers around just graduating high school, success in mm -hmm. high school, and how success in middle school prepares them for high school. And yeah, I know yeah. It's, it's too much for 12. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, uh, let's see. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read uh, a message from Jenny. Oh, 
Oh, okay. Yeah. So what is the um, one thing to think about, you know, can students freely drop? Right, if they're in an honors course and feel like they can't make it, are they just allowed to drop? Are they, you know, given some additional support to, you know, help them to, you know, stay in? Um, that might be something to also think about. Sorry. Um, hi, I'm, I'm one of the teachers here at Central. Um, one of the things that happens with a lot of these kids, like the, the district is doing a really nice job um, trying to get, you know, students of color into AP and honors classes. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the reasons why a lot of them drop the class or want to, uh, want to drop the class is it's not just um, they get the support at school because the, the teachers and the, the teams work really hard at, you know, keeping them in and giving them that, giving them that extra support and tutoring, um, mental programs and things of that nature. But you also have what happens at home, which a lot of times you don't take into play. You know, if you're coming from a household where, you know, your parents might not have been college bound or, you know, or they may have some deficits. You have a lot of siblings in the household. Those mm -hmm. things come into play too. So sometimes it's not, you know, they don't want it. They, they're not quitting because they don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. It's just that they don't have that support, you know, that's needed. Because it's not just inside the school where mm -hmm. you need support. You also need it at home because you're coming home with work, right? Right. And, you know, there are a lot of, you know, uh, projects you may need to do, homework you need to do, just studying you need to do, and a lot of times that's the portion that, you know, kind of goes awry, mm -hmm. you know, that the people at school have no control over and may not even know. So I, that, I was just going to ask, so, I mean, how do you all respond if, you know, there's a, a, a Black girl who says, you know, I want to stay in this honors class? but these assignments, this homework, you know, I cannot do it at home. You know, what what becomes her option? You know, or she's, you know, clearly advocating saying, I wanna do this, but the way, you know, life at home is set up or, you know, I have to work or whatever. Are there opportunities for, you know, alternative, you know, ways of learning or, you know, doing things in school? Um, and, and to me, these are larger, you know, questions uh, about whether or not classes and opportunities within school are structured enough to support those students who really don't have the support outside of school. And of course, schools can't do everything, but you know, what do you do for a student you really see has the talent, you know, has the desire, but doing those types of assignments, for example, are you know, untenable, you know, outside of uh, the school setting. Um, who, who would they go to for, support to, you know, remain in that class and, you know, do things while they're at school. Those are, I mean, again, these are more challenging questions, but um, I think worth exploring, especially when you all see talented students um, who have or are struggling uh, with their home life. I think it's even more challenging now with COVID and you don't have the, the physical building to do um, a lot of that, but but I mean, I think you're raising a, a really important point mm -hmm. uh, about the larger environmental piece and how it affects students. There could be enough going on outside the school to say, I need to drop this. <laughs> you know, I need, I cannot do it um, that you can't control. And I can't speak for, you know, all the other schools, but I know at Central, um, we have like a really, a really great group of, of staff members that if something like that ever happened, they would jump right in. Because I've, I've seen it where you have students who are struggling, you know, students who are having issues and, mm -hmm. you know, the teachers will jump right in. So I wonder how do you all, how do you all create that as a model 
for the other schools to, you know. Um, well, I'm not saying the other schools don't. I just oh, okay. On their on their behalf, because I'm not there. Yeah, okay. But I'm not saying the other schools, you know, don't. But I can speak on I can speak on behalf of my my home school. Mm -hmm. That you know, we really have a a great group of educators that do a really nice job, you know, jumping in, especially when you have kids in crisis or you know, kids who need help with whatever they need help with. Mm -hmm. So there's a comment here about unfair grading practices in some of the buildings that are oppressive, like the daily graded homework with hard deadlines, lack of understanding and lack of flexibility regarding responsibilities some, some students have at home. Uh, yeah, I mean, these policies do deter students um, uh, in a major way. And it's usually those who, you know, maybe are low income from low income families or, um, you know, expected to take on these more adult roles. Uh, and again, they don't have the physical presence of being at school as, you know, um, to, to divide their time. So I, I wonder, um, and I, I'm sure that the district has, you know, some sort of assessment, but I just, um, wonder how some of those students are faring during um, COVID-19, maybe even some of the ones, students of color who were, who were or are taking um, these honors classes. Um, are there other questions I can answer or comments? Okay. Um, well, I like as uh, posted earlier in the uh, chat, uh, my email is patentdavis.1 uh, at OSU. Um, I certainly wish all of you the very best. Um, this has just been a really, I don't know, tumultuous time dealing with, you know, so much going on. Um, but just, you know, wishing you all the best as you continue to do, you know, learning from home or in your buildings, um, if you're able to go back, dealing with our current political climate, uh, societal racism, like there's just a lot going on. Um, but I, you know, really wish you all the best um, in your endeavors, especially as they pertain to serving um, Black girls. Now, I don't know who the where the facilitator is. Do we just get, do you all need to stay on here or do we just hang up? I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Have a great day.